Welcome to Bell Talks. Today I will speak with uh, Tommy Gurigsen and Morten Travik, director and artist and one of the main protagonists of the documentary film War of Art. Welcome. Um, my first question is, um, one of the theses in the beginning of the film is that there is no, that the country is pretty closed and there, that there is no possibility to the, for the influences from the West to the, in the Korea. Uh, and also that there is no contemporary or modern art. But for most of us that don't know much about Korea, we can just see the news and find something on the internet. But I could see, for example, the, the hotel in the heart of Pyongyang, which looks really modern, futuristic. And recently I discovered a book called Friend. I think that is now internationally sold, like it is translated in English a few months ago. And it's really modern. And the writer is not even a dissident. He's the member of the party. So do you really think, do you still think that there is no possibilities for modern art, contemporary art in Korea? And that there are no, some secret channels uh, for it? Um, I. I I don't know whether, I don't remember actually whether that thesis is uh, expressed in that way that, that um, it is such a closed country. Uh, of course, the, the narrative about North Korea has always and will always be that it is a very closed country because this makes uh, films and uh, any narrative about North Korea more interesting. Uh, the fact is that it's a, an extremely controlled society. It's not really that difficult to get into North Korea. Anybody can go there as a tourist, basically, and maybe apart from Americans and, and South Koreans. But there are several, most people are not aware that there are actually almost 300,000 tourists visiting North Korea every year. Uh, but because 270,000 of those are Chinese, uh, in the West, we don't hear so much about it. So that's one myth which uh, uh, deserves to, to be challenged a little bit. Um, then when it comes to, to the um, cut-offness from the world and from the currents of, of modern art, uh, I think that is probably, it used to be like that uh, until a few decades ago. Then North Korea really was a very closed-off society. Uh, I think today, because you simply cannot, even though you want to, protect yourself against uh, the, the global information flows in the way you could in the old days. Uh, the case in North Korea today is more that many people are aware, and, and the party and the, and the regime are aware of the outside world and, and aware of quite a lot of what is um, being said and written about North Korea and, and a lot of the information. But their strategy now is to uh, ideologically oppose it uh, and be very, very um, uh, extremely negative and extremely guarded against uh, those, those impulses. So I think this is what happened in the case of the DMZ Academy, which is the project that, that, that War of Art uh, deals with. Uh, it's not necessarily that that North Korean professional artists know nothing about uh, Western art. It's just that they are um, taught and pressured into rejecting it. So I think our group, <laughs> conscious, uh, both consciously and accidentally, I think we incarnated all the... Um, uh, all the negative prejudice uh, that they expected about crazy Western uh, conceptual artists. I don't know what Tommy thinks, but this is... Yeah, just... yeah, yeah, I quite agree. I think it's important to distinguish between uh, being closed off and being controlled. And I think it's the control that uh, is very, very present, of course, in, in, in North Korea. And also uh, to distinguish modern technology from uh, things like um, um, 
uh, other cultural influences because you, you can see a lot of technology that's quite modern in, in North Korea. Actually, last time we were there, you know, I saw kids on segways and and uh, a lot of I think they 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 receive a lot of benefits from from China and actually they they have a lot of things that are really really important. Smartphones, yeah. tablets. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but it's it's you know it's the the expression. Uh, the freedom of expression and speech, you know, these things are really, really controlled. So, uh, and uh, that might, you might say is old fashioned, but uh, I think if you go there and expect a really like uh, stone age society, you're going to be really surprised. And I don't, uh, and I also hope that the film uh, shows that. Surprised and disappointed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, do you think there is a market and the audience for contemporary art, like to be present in the lives of most of the people, not just a small group of artists in in the capital city? I think in the, the, I think this is one of the cultural, uh, not only cultural but also philosophical clashes that that the project and the film um, attempts to to highlight and to play with is that you could say in, in today's contemporary, Western contemporary art, uh, art world, art is basically anything you can get away with. Uh, and art is anything you can call art and uh, get somebody to agree that it's art. It's, it's, it's a kind of consensual transaction between the, the artist and whoever uh, validates this as art. Uh, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I mean, ever since... Marcel Duchamp's, uh, you know, pissoir, uh, ready-made in 1912, that th this has been the case. Um, and in that vein, you could say that, that all of North Korea can be, depending on your art view, but in my art view, all of, all of North Korea, because of its extremely high degree of choreography and, and, and control, can be seen as a, a devised, uh, permanent installation. Um, so you could say that the market is already there. It's just that the uh, the buyers don't know it because they're part of it. Uh, when it comes to, um, but of course I will take your question more more literally, like it was probably meant. Uh, there is no market at all for uh, contemporary uh, or for any not only art, but for, for any kind of statement or expression that questions the, um, that, that, that questions the prevailing ideology or that, that, that questions uh, the fundamentals of the state. Uh, then again, this is, this is also totally different from our, um, you could say decadent Western art uh, philosophy, which more or less always is expected to question uh, the pre prevailing um, uh, standards of thought or, or, or worldviews and so on. Uh, North Korean art, on the contrary, is expected to confirm and celebrate the, um, the status quo. So uh, this is also one of the reasons why, not, not the only one, made you, but, uh, mind you, but one of the main reasons why we turned out to be so unwelcome, our group of artists in North Korea at that particular time, because uh, at that particular time, there was very few things that North Korean, uh, that North Korea wanted less than anything questioning the, uh, the prevailing narrative, you could say. Yeah, and I also think, uh, uh, in reference to, to to the last question, also I think it's easy to uh, to to judge or to think that the reason why they're so um, you could say closed off is because of lack of information. Um, where, where I my experience is that a lot of their choices or values are not based on the lack of information or or choices. It's it's they they have something more strong stronger in common. And I think if you 
uh, underestimate that that power, then then you're really really far away from understanding that society and being able to communicate with it, or I think make change. And uh, I, I would say, you know, if you go there, I, I think it's it's really hard for us to understand that they would choose to live there. But uh, I also know that if someone came from the future with a time machine and invited me to live in 2050, I wouldn't choose to do so. Even though they had greater technology, even a better democracy or whatever, I would choose to live in 2020 because this is my time. This is my society. This is what I know. And uh, so I think a lot of what we value and cherish in our lives is because we know it and uh, we can deal with it, even though there are, uh, you know, there, there might be restrictions and there might be uh, really, really poor conditions, but still to many people that's life. And I also think that is something about art. I don't think it's that they have never seen uh, what you call modern art or uh, experimental art. I just don't think they have acquired a taste for it yet. And uh, I think someone also, of course, if you are in, in a governmental position, you would, be, you would be afraid that they would acquire that taste. But it's, uh, it takes a while. And of course, it's these small arrows of, uh, of modern art that uh, Martin has been really good at uh, injecting. And of course, it changes people, not by mile at a time, but it's, it's, uh, it's step by step. And of course... I think all those people who met Matt Morton and the other artists, they will be changed in a way. If it's a good or bad way, you know, that depends on who you ask. But I think it's really hard to, to meet other people with very differing uh, views or opinions or methods or, or philosophies and not being changed in any way. Uh, so, so, of course, it's, uh, that's a very, very scary and um, demanding exercise. You said that if you could choose to go back in the past and or to stay in this time and the state you live, you would choose what you know. And do you think that maybe that can explain why they look so happy? Because the constatation of all the artists who came there for the first time was that people look really happy and content in their lives. And we cannot say that for most of the Western societies. I can go first. I think it's really uh, difficult to, to judge whether a people is happy or not. You know, it's uh, people waiting for the bus generally look unhappy. <laughs> people look bored. People, you know, they are uh, tired or whatever. But I think why people, a lot of people going to Pyongyang say that they look happy is because they look happier than what you expected because you expected robots. You know, you expected people marching, uh, looking down, being afraid of the big brother. But when you realize that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a society like most other big cities you go to. People are also whistling. They are holding hands with their kids and they are, you know, talking about what they're going to do tonight. And uh, some of them are flirting and going on dates. You know, that's, that's being uh, human life. And uh, I think you will, even though there are, like I said, some serious, serious restrictions. I think, you know, people have the ability to find a meaningful life within those restrictions. I think that is a gift that we as human beings have that doesn't make it, you know, less problematic or controversial for us because we take things like freedom of speech uh, almost for granted. And we, we couldn't have, you know, uh, ever accepted to live in a society that uh, doesn't have that. But I know, uh, I think it's, it's, it's difficult for me as a Democrat, because I would say that, like I'm an ex extremist Democrats, <laughs> because we are, especially in Scandinavia, uh, that you have to ex accept that maybe people can be happier in a, a controlled regime uh, than we thought or like to think. I think, I think that's, a very, that's a very precise, uh, very good point um, that, that, that Tommy makes there. That um, there, for me, th through my years of working in North Korea, North Korea has become a kind of, a, not, not only a window into to another um, kind of society, but also kind of like a mirror uh, that I see um, some, and, and, and a bit caricature <laughs> of our own society, because there are some traits, some characteristics that are actually almost just as much present in our society. It's just that it has other forms and other platforms. 
Um, and for instance, uh, the culture wars that, that we in the, in the Western cultural sphere are now in the middle of between so-called progressive and so-called populist uh, is, is one example. And, and the, um, I would say that the, the censorship and the self-censorship is a very, very strong human instinct, which is very closely connected with, um, connected with, with the collective. Uh, you know, you don't need to stay on social media for more than half a day uh, on, before you notice this, the, this climate of uh, groupthink and uh, herd mentality and, uh, and also punishment of those perceived not to follow the, the norm. So, so this is also another, I think, aspect of, of authoritarian and even totalitarian societies that, that, that people who have not experienced it firsthand uh, tend to totally overlook is that um, self-censorship is actually the most common and most efficient form of censorship. Uh, in most cases, not only in North Korea, you don't need a thug with a gun uh, against your head because you are already taking care of this yourself by, by restricting yourself. And if you don't do it, then certainly there is a Twitter mob standing you know, at the ready to, to, uh, um, to do it. Uh, so this is just one, of ex one example of, I think what Tommy also touches into that, that there are, in, 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 although of course, I will in no way compare the North Korean political system with, for instance, the Norwegian or even the Serbian, but uh, it, it, it's a much, much more restrictive, much, much more con controlled and authoritarian system. But in the interaction between people, and the very, very, I would say, uh, uh, all human um, uh, social mechanisms, North Korea is not really that different. Uh, as I've said, also keep on saying, it's, it's not another planet, it's just another country. So, so this is also something to keep in mind, I think, um, when, when, uh, when discussing both the project and the film, but also how we relate to perceivedly strange and, and foreign places such as North Korea. I agree. And I also usually compare it uh, with um, a religious cult more than a society, because if you're looking for a society or a state like, like in, in Europe, you're, it's pretty hard to, to compare it in many ways because they don't have like a, a current affairs, public discussions like we do. And pretty much all our society is based on public discussions. Uh, but they have some very clear values and things they, uh, they cherish. And that's as a very strong bond. And to me, it's, it's more like a religious cult. And sometimes it's uh, when you have people like in the Scientology church or whatever, it's not like they, they lack uh, uh, interaction with other people or information. They, they know that their colleagues at work think they're crazy because they're in that church or whatever, but they still choose to be there. So there is something that connects them and, you know, uh, makes it worth it, even though there are restrictions, even though there are, uh, there can be abuse in a lot of, uh, um, in a lot of religious cults, there are abuse, but there is also love. And you have those, both of those elements there, still there. And uh, I think if you look at it more like a religious movement that wants to be left alone in a way, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to understand it and accept it as, as a place in the world uh, and, and why they act like they do. But if you're trying to, 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 you know, to, to compare them to our society, how our society works, it's, it's, they're very different. But like Morten said, there are a lot of similarities, like how uh, women's rights, I think, in North Korea are far better than a lot of other places in the world. And like maternity leave uh, this is pretty much the same arrangement as in Norway, which is like you have 10, 10 12 months uh, with payment. Uh, kindergartens, their age of retirement, that they work uh, at uh, 37.5 hours a week, 
things like that. That is, it's quite the same of how we organize our lives and, and society. So it's, it's how you look at it. And you said there is something that keeps them united. Like, is that maybe a fear? What do you think? Like, if you have freedom? No, I, I, don't think, I don't think fear can hold, keep you united in a way. It can keep you, keep you in control. You know, you can behave because of fear. But in the long run, I think you will have problems. Keep, you know, it's, like, it's not like the Arabic Spring going on. You don't get the feeling that they, they are uh, rattling the, the bars and, and getting ready for a big violent revolt. Of course, then you would also see how many people flee the country. You know, it's not, it's not that many. It's, it's less than you would think. And it's surprising because it's not that hard to get to China, for example. So why aren't they all fleeing uh, or making um, more attempts at, at a revolt? I don't think it's, of course, it's fair. They, they have a collective fear, but you also have that in a religious cult, for example. You have fear of what's going to happen if you break the rules. But it's, I, don't, I, I, I do think they fear the leadership, but I also think they feel love. They feel love and fear. And that's the complex part of it. And that's why it's, it's really hard, I think, to deal with it as a society and a state because it has this duality of love and fear and it's mixed together. And they, uh, I think a lot of them accept that that exists in their, their lives and, and, and in their, is going to be there for their lifetime. No, I, I, when I asked you about the fear, I didn't mean like uh, the fear from the authorities or the war but fear like if they do something, if they move to China, for example, yeah. uh, they will be free maybe. They will have more options and maybe it's a fear of being able to have your liberty, your freedom, personal freedom and responsibility this, that goes with it. Because in the collective society, the guilt is always collective. It's not yep. personal. Of course you have that fear and of course they will be uh, uh, taking action towards maybe your family or, or uh, of course that's a big factor into it. But you, I think you have that a lot of spaces in the world. As a refugee, it's not going to be uh, a great uh, easy path to a better life. I think you see that with people, you know, bringing their kids over the Mediterranean in, in small uh, boats without life jackets. I don't think being a refugee is an easy choice anywhere in the world almost. So of course there is, uh, there will, can be and will be and have been a lot of consequences to fleeing North Korea. But still you would think that living in the worst country in the world, as they say, the uh, uh, more people would try to cross the border or get away with it or make, um, uh, try to start a revolution. Do you want to say something, Martin, or we should ask another question? Yeah, maybe I could add something to, to what, um, what Thomas says about the, 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 the cult parallel. And, and I want to elaborate a little bit on that, because all cults, uh, religious or not, uh, are more, I mean, maybe not all, maybe there are one or two weird cults somewhere that don't, but apart from those, uh, all cults are actually built on the family model uh, with um, uh, a father or, and or a mother figure and the followers as children. Uh, these, these parallels are very clear if you look at, at any kind of uh, religious or, or, or ideological even uh, hierarchy, you will find the family as the, as the blueprint. And this uh, not least has been exploited to the full in uh, North Korea. You would even, you would even um, find this totally openly in, the, in any kind of propaganda or, or, or uh, um, uh, rhetoric from the authorities that Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un or, or Kim Il-sung is our father and our mother. Uh, and, and even this, this is taken quite far even in uh, lyrics for patriotic songs that, that we are the children um, drinking the milk of the breasts of, of, of the leader. So, so the leader is even some kind of hermaphroditic uh, deity, you could say in a way. Uh, so, so I would 
I'm, I'm quite often making a parallel between the relation between the, the North Korean regime and its subjects to that of, uh, of abusive parents. And uh, abusive parents, I think, as, as Tommy also touched upon, that you, you can both fear and love uh, at the same time. So it's a quite complex relationship with, of course, different degrees of those two, uh, different proportions of fear and, and love. Uh, another thing which keeps, which is a kind of a, a glue for the North Korean society and the North Korean state is this um, feeling or it is the siege mentality. And I think, I think well, I, I suppose that for a Serbian, uh, this is, is not totally unfamiliar territory because to my knowledge also the Serbian national mythology uh, has a lot of siege mentality in it uh, and, and, and builds quite a lot on the notion of being surrounded by powerful enemies and standing up for what is good and right uh, or Christian and, and so on. So, and, and this is also very heavily uh, exploited by the, by the North Korean state um, in its ideological uh, conditioning and, and um, upbringing of its people. So uh, both, you could say, uh, just as important as the apprehension and the fear of making a mistake uh, inside the country, just as important is the, uh, the notion of the leaders, the leadership as the only one who guarantees the survival of our country as we know it. And which is also totally true. I mean, if, if the, the leadership falls, then the North Korean state will also fall and eventually be absorbed by South Korea. So, so it's, it's not even a lie. It's, it's very, very real. And this, um, so, so this notion also plays a part. And I think we, uh, due to timing, uh, which was very fortitious for the movie, I would say, maybe not so fortitious for, for, for the the things we wanted to achieve with, with, with the workshop, but we got there on a time when that siege mentality went into overdrive uh, in, the, in the early autumn of 2017, when, when Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un were, were in a very intense war of words. Uh, and um, to me, it was very obvious that, that this time the North Korean uh, state was actually quite scared because they would not, they, did not know Trump, he was an unknown entity. Now, after two so-called summits, now they know that he's just a clown, of course, although a, a very uh, unpredictable one. But at that time, they, they were truly scared. And we, we this uh, fortunately and unfortunately uh, influenced the climate a lot uh, during our, our visit there, which you also, I think, will, will see plenty <laughs> in the film. You said, you mentioned Trump and the war of words in that time, and there was also a danger, danger, like say it like that, of nuclear war with that testing uh, in, also in the fall of 2017. Was that the inspiration for the film title? Uh, it's been there for a while. Of course, you have the, the art of war and uh, that being uh, what it is. And... Of course, it's like in, in the context we are talking about now, the cult regime, the, the, the expression of culture is really important. And it has been like that also for the US. And it's very easy to see the propaganda art in North Korea, but you will in the archives find uh, the counterparts in the US. So using art uh, in warfare has been uh, going on for a long time. And... Uh, of course, the DMC Academy is, is a very good microclimate to see it in its extreme. I also wanted to ask you about the project, about uh, cultural exchange between the artists from the West and from Korea. I'm saying from the West, I'm including China there also. Uh, what from the outside, it would maybe be more appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is your idea? Uh, for that cultural exchange, and how did you choose the characters? I mean, there some of them are pretty extreme. I have to say. I mean, even for the for the societies in Europe, 
Yeah, well, you know, extreme or not extreme, everything is relative, I guess. Um, but um, some of those artists were uh, colleagues and colleagues of mine who, and, uh, who I regularly work with uh, in my other projects. Uh, for instance, uh, Jean, the Val Noir, the, the French artist. Um, also, uh, the that was part of the um, ambition with the project. It was to see, I mean, to uh, it, with my experience from previous projects in North Korea, my uh, um, experience was that the North Koreans don't really care whether how extreme your art is. I mean, of course, if you if you, you can't jump around naked and, and, and take a dump on on Kim Il Sung Square, for instance, within still within limits, but but th th they don't really see the difference between uh, I don't know Yoko Ono and Johnny Rotten, because they are both from the outside and they both do strange things. So in that perspective, you could say I didn't really. Um, I figured it, it, it didn't really make such a big difference uh, uh, what kind of, of, of art those artists were making. So I took artists that I self appreciated. Um, I, I, some of, quite a f very few of them I approached. Most of them approached me. Um, I got to know during my previous North Korea projects, including the, 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 the Leibach concert in, in 2015. Uh, so I kind of, I would say also in, in a certain synergy with the, the, the film, with Tommy, who came on board quite early in this process, um, to try to tailor a team that had a diverse background uh, and that all of them, one way or the other, challenged notions about what is art. Uh, and not only in North Korea. Uh, in, in, in general. So, um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, one, one factor for me was personal preference. Another one was diversity and diversity of background and, and of um, artistic language and of tools and, and also of genre. Uh, a third one was that um, it had to be, you know, I think, I thought it should be good in entertainment to bring such a such a group in, and I and I think that shows. Yeah, I uh, uh, I think Morton explains it well. Uh, to to me, they were of course film characters, and what I like about the way that they are quite, if you might say, extreme or conventional or whatever. I I like the fact that they uh, some of their views and performances on art you know it's it's uh, also quite um challenging for let's say an european audience or a western audience an international audience whatever you choose and uh, that's sometimes gives us as filmmakers the possibility to to you know change the perspective of the audience and they find themselves sometimes agreeing with the north koreans and if you sit in a cinema or in front of the television and you find yourself agreeing with a North Korean uh, state official, I think, you know, to me, that is enough. That's worth the trip. I think that's uh, very hard to achieve. And then you just uh, realize that, okay, maybe we have something, something in common. It's, uh, uh, we, uh, I, I really agree that's not art or whatever. And I, we share the dislike. We have a common dislike of, uh, of decadent art. <laughs> <laughs> and and also I you know I I also like the way that Martin with his uh, casting or what would you say set up is also you know challenging the dilemma in art between uh, good craftsmanship and idea and you know maybe in, in in our part of the world like Martin also said about earlier what you can get away with idea has become uh so important in, in in modern art and i think it's this is a really cool way to challenge that concept and say you know what happened to the craftsmanship can it be art also with the only craftsmanship and no idea when and, and that that's what i really like about it of course it's not the greatest foundation for uh what would you say uh, uh a normal 
um, symposium or workshop. You know, you could have really uh, uh, conservative, let's say that artists from the outside who would, who would be easier for them to tolerate or who could speak their language. And I mean that in a visual way. Um, uh, but I, I'm not sure that that would actually prove Morton's point. Uh, and it might not have also given the film uh, that uh, we tried to make. So, so uh, I think we, uh, Morton is an artist and uh, he, he's not going there as a bureaucrat, not as a journalist, he's not there as a politician, not there as a peace broker. So uh, I think he's entitled to, to choose his, um, his colleagues and uh, have his, you know, his motives and agenda for, for, for the trip. And I think that is also very fascinating. And a big part of the film is to try to figure out everything. And I, you know, still three years since we went and I'm still trying to figure out what happened. And when you, when you decided to do that cultural exchange, was your... I mean, did you think that it is possible and that, or you thought that because you had that Liberation Day concert uh, Leibach in Pyongyang before and did it look more like an accident or something that happened like accidentally, not purposely, or you thought like it's possible, it's not just one way affair, it's possible to exchange opinions and thoughts about art no definitely it was it what happened was no accident at all uh, and this is this is a um, a part of the story of the project that is not depicted uh, that much in the film for I, I mean as a director I understand very well that that you have to choose the, the, the narratives especially with such a complex um, uh, web of different characters and, and, and also a, a story which is not like a, necessarily a, a, a classical from, from A to Z story either. So, but but the, fact, the fact is uh, that everything was prepared and um, agreed upon with our North Korean hosts well in advance, months in advance, years in advance. Uh, not only about which artists would be coming, but also about which artworks they would uh, be presenting. Uh, and also because my experience, my year, years of experience with North Korea uh, has shown me that you need to be really, really accurate and not leave anything to, to um, neither, neither uh, chance uh, nor for them to, to figure out for themselves, because then you won't get anything of what you ask for. So I was very, very careful uh, in advance to, to be very, very specific about uh, what we were there to achieve, who we wanted to meet, what we wanted to do, to the point that I had, had even written uh, a week schedule of where we were going to go, what we were going to show, and so on. And everything was approved in advance. So this is also why... Um, Bo both for, for, for human reasons, one of our most trusted, one of my best North Korean friends actually, uh, uh, had some very huge alcohol problems uh, for years, which unfortunately uh, had um, blossomed totally uh, at the point when we were to realize this, the last part of the project, which was the, the workshop. Uh, uh, another thing was that the political circumstances that, that changed quite rapidly, uh, suddenly the, the North, North Korea was all about showing defiance towards the outside world. Uh, so, for instance, the, the scene in the film where you see uh, Nick, the, the German uh, sound artist, where you see him also doing exactly things that were already approved by the North Koreans and, and, uh, and agreed upon. When he goes into the uh, out on a, a square next to our hotel in the early morning and and records some sound and then Mr. Hum, one of our North Korean minders, freaks out totally, is because Mr. Hum is afraid that somebody, during these political circumstances with USA threatening to with fire and fury and so on, that somebody on the street will 
look at Nick, a white guy in the middle of Pyongyang, sticks out like a sore thumb and thinks that he's a spy uh, with his microphones and so on, and his, and his tech, tech gear. So um, both on the micro, you could say on the micro and the macro level, uh, things changed quite a lot uh, before our arrival. So uh, when we were there, you can imagine also this, um, uh, in many ways, hilarious uh, scene in the film where suddenly our minders turn into art sensors and who are going to once again go through all the artworks that we are bringing in or, or the, that we want to show to our North Korean artist colleagues. Now our minders from the, our hosts from the Committee for Cultural Relations suddenly turn into art sensors and they want to go through everything with us again and censor most of it. This was totally uh, not what we agreed upon in advance. So, uh, so that is, I mean, it, it works very well uh, in the film because it, it, it makes the, it makes our, our, our trip seem even more kamikaze than it actually was. But, but the truth is that everything, there were a lot of circumstances that were beyond both my and, and even you know, my North Korean partners control that, that very strongly made this much more into a war zone, both literally and metaphorically than it, than it uh, would have been else, uh, in, in, in other circumstances. What were the reactions of, of the artists after the visit and after the workshop? Were they disappointed? I mean, some of them said in the beginning that they want to meet Korean artists, people, to see the culture, to know more, but I suppose that they wanted to, to show their art, to, to have a purpose, and they couldn't do it. Like most of them couldn't do it in a way that it's presentable. I think the most immediate reaction for, for, for many of them was just relief to have survived with their mental and physical health intact. Uh, and then, uh, at least the ones that I stay in touch with, who, who are most of the, of the group, um, with some exceptions, but most people uh, with the, the benefit of, of, of a longer and longer time, uh, time frame between them and, and then, uh, have gotten a lot of, of inspiration out of it. Uh, both Jean Valnois, the, the, the French, French artist, and Nick, for instance, are still making work that are very uh, clearly uh, and explicitly influenced by, uh, by, by that trip three years ago. So, um, which also, I mean, uh, I think for me is a quite important point to make that it doesn't have to be positive to inspire you. I think for quite on the contrary, for, for many of us in, in the creative, um, uh, in, in, in working creatively, uh, something that really shakes you up and, and um, challenges you can, can trigger just as much or, or, or even more than something that, uh, that um, caresses you and, uh, and pleases you. Uh, watching the film, I, I had an impression that, at least to me, it looked like a theater play. Did you, when you were like, you directed the film, have the same feeling that everything like, you all know your roles there, they are defined. I mean, you cannot predict some things, but it's pretty much like watching the theater performance. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a good question. I you know I... And that was my third trip to North Korea with Morten. Uh, he is a trained theater director from Moscow. And uh, this was his, uh, this was <laughs> his uh, academy. So I, I would leave that up to the audience to decide whether it was a theater play or, uh, or if it was a director of it all, or they were peasants on, on um, on the chessboard, chessboard or if it was um, what it was. I think, you know, that's, uh, that's the beauty of it. Good casting is half the job, more than half the job, I would say. Okay. 
in any in any film or theater work. No, but to be to, to be to be serious about it, I think going there is uh, very hard to imagine how, how uh, to to be there for like 10, 12, 14 days. It is uh, a situation and a state of mind that you cannot, I think, imagine before you go there. And it's especially the last five, six days is, is, is really, really, it's, it, it wears you down. It really does. And uh, I think that, that that will, you see that in the film and you also feel that. Uh, and I think that that also... Uh, Martin is right, people were relieved to go home, but he was and I was also, it was quite serious in the end. And uh, I think also for some of those artists, it's, it's, it's a valuable lesson in how to lower your expectations, <laughs> how to make compromises that you would never think you would do. And this is also, I think, an important lesson of a controlling regime is that you're pretty fast, you're, you're changing and you're doing things that you didn't expect. I, 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 Every time I've gone there, because um, what you really feel the restriction is that you cannot move that freely. You know, we are, we are taken around in a bus. Even if it's only two, 300 meters, you're taken in a bus. Um, and uh, when I go home after two weeks there and I uh, go into my car, I start the engine. And before I, I drive, I, I, I feel this physical presence in my body you know it's saying you're not allowed to do this this is not right you're committing a crime and it's not my head because i know i'm in my car in, in norway and i'm allowed to drive a car but it's my body it's telling me that you're doing something wrong and i i've experienced this every time and it shows you know only in in two weeks you you can start to have a physical reaction to breaking rules and i think that's that's been like a mind-boggling experience. There's ho still hope for you, Tommy. You can yes, still be, so. you can still be disciplined and, uh, and, yeah. and, and, and conditioned. Yeah. Thank you for talking with me today. I would, I would just uh, like to add that that uh, I am still, and and so is Tommy, very welcome back to North Korea. And just the other day, I got a long email from our hosts, the, the Committee for Cultural Relations, who uh, asking me when, wh when can I come back once the COVID situation is over and so on. So, so that's also said something, that even a project like that uh, hasn't actually, um, uh, we didn't burn any bridges, uh, even with a project like that. And, and that I think is, is a, some, somehow, uh, a hopeful note to to end this conversation on maybe